Okay guys, what I wanna do here is just go over terms of trade real quick, a real quick review. Um, before we get started though, I've created a few different sheets. One that you can go along with this presentation right here, the terms of trade practice work that you can find in the description down below. The other one is the terms of trade kind of test resource cheat sheet, however you want to put it, something you can use on the exam. It's open notes this year, so something you can have that kind of guarantee that you're going to do it in the right way. And that's the process I'm going to be going over in this presentation right here. Two terms that you need to know before we go into this. Domestic price, I'll be referring to this, and that basically is the opportunity cost. What would it cost if I don't trade with another country to produce it here? If I give up one of this item, what, or if I'm producing one of this item, what am I giving up to produce it? Now, terms of trade, this is the relative price of exports. What is it, what am I getting in exchange for what I'm giving? And in, in order for to the terms of trade to be mutually beneficial, it needs to fall between the opportunity costs. And that's what I'm really trying to get at and trying to get you guys to understand in this presentation. So the first uh, production possibility frontier that we see on this page is Catherine and Yvonne. They are producing hot dogs and hamburgers. We can pull the information from the production possibility frontier and we're gonna set it up in a certain way and this is the process I want you guys to follow and try to do so that way when you're taking the exam, you don't make any mistakes because there are a lot of flip-flops that you can make in this. You know, flip-flopping opportunity costs, that sort of thing. It's an easy mistake to make and I'm trying to give you a, a, a method that doesn't allow for a mistake. So we pull this information. Now, the next thing we need to get is the opportunity cost. So we have our production data up top, Yvonne and Catherine's ability to produce burgers and hot dogs. Now let's pull our opportunity costs. And I'll do another presentation to explain opportunity costs. If you need help on that, a real quick easy method that uh, sacrifice divided by what you produce and produce divided by what you sacrifice, those kind of methods if you don't know them already. So we get our opportunity cost here. The next thing we need to know is who has the comparative advantage? Getting this stuff all done ahead of time before you even look at the questions or try to answer the questions is really beneficial because you don't make any mistakes then. So we need to find out who has the lower opportunity cost. Yvonne, in terms of burgers, has the lower opportunity cost. So we're gonna put Yvonne's name right there. Now when it comes to hot dogs, Catherine's gonna have the lower opportunity cost with one and a quarter burger versus that one and a half burger. So Yvonne and Catherine, we've identified which they have the comparative advantage in. The only thing we're missing for this whole setup at this point is the terms of trade or what falls in between the opportunity costs. Because a lot of these kind of questions have one or two points dedicated to terms of trade. So what falls between the opportunity cost? Yvonne's opportunity cost is two-thirds of a hot dog. Catherine's is four-fifths. So three-quarters of a hot dog is one that fits in there. Now, it doesn't mean that that's the only answer. Anything greater than two-thirds but less than four-fifths would be an acceptable terms of trade. One burger for three-quarters of a hot dog. One burger for seven-tenths of a hot dog. So any of those would work as long as it falls between in those opportunity costs. Now in terms of hot dogs, one hot dog for one and one-third burger would be an acceptable terms of trade. It falls between those two opportunity costs. So now that we have all the information we need, let's start to attack the questions that we have. So who has the comparative advantage in producing hot dogs? We look down to our chart. We've got Catherine has the comparative advantage in producing hot dogs. So we got the answer right there. Should Yvonne import or export hot dogs is the next question. If Catherine has a comparative advantage in something, she's gonna be exporting it. You export the thing you have the comparative advantage in. So Catherine's gonna be exporting hot dogs, so Yvonne should be importing hot dogs. All right, next question. Who has the comparative advantage in producing burgers? We look down below, Yvonne does, okay? She sacrifices less hot dogs than Catherine to do this. We already have the answer down there. So Yvonne is the answer. Now, should Yvonne import or export hamburgers? If Yvonne has the comparative advantage, she should be exporting hamburgers. Now, this is where it gets a little more wordy and a little more complicated, but if both Catherine and Yvonne exclusively produce the product that they have the comparative advantage in, what are acceptable terms of trade? And explain why with regards to domestic price. The first part of this question is something you would see in an, on an FRQ. The second part I've never seen show up, explain why, but I'm gonna give you an answer just so you understand with regards to that domestic cost, why they choose to trade under some circumstances and not under others, okay? So when we look at this, what are acceptable terms of trade? We know that one burger in exchange for three quarters of a hot dog does fall between those terms of trade. Now explaining why is a little more difficult. So. Yvonne's opportunity cost of producing one burger is two thirds of a hot dog. She could easily exchange one of her own burgers, stop producing that and get two thirds of a hot dog in instead. 
So in terms of trade, she needs to receive more than that. Otherwise, she can do it herself. Her domestic price is two-thirds of a hot dog. So if Yvonne trades one burger for three quarters of a hot dog, she receives more than at her domestic cost of one burger in exchange for two thirds of a hot dog. Okay. Now Catherine's opportunity cost of a hamburger is four fifths of a hot dog. She could give up four fifths of a hot dog to produce one burger at any point. So she's not willing to pay four fifths or anything higher than that because she could do it herself. So Catherine pays only three quarters of a hot dog for one burger through trade when her domestic cost is four-fifths. So we've explained, Catherine's getting more than she would producing it herself. Yvonne's getting more trading than she would exchanging that herself. So both of them benefit. This is why we have mutually beneficial trade when it falls between the opportunity cost. All right, now question four. If the terms of trade were set up as one hamburger for one hot dog, who would benefit from this trade? Okay, Yvonne could trade one burger for anything more than two-thirds of a hot dog, so Yvonne is good in this situation. However, Catherine's not willing to sacrifice any more than four-fifths of a hot dog for a burger because she could do it herself. So Yvonne would benefit from this trade, but not Catherine. Catherine is, would be paying too much that she could just do it domestically. Her domestic price of a burger is four-fifths of a hot dog. So she's not willing to pay a full hot dog for a burger, so this trade doesn't work for her. She does not benefit from it. The last question, if terms of trade were set up as 10 hamburgers for seven hot dogs, who would benefit from this trade? Now let's take a look at it. 10 burgers for seven hot dogs. This is the exact same trade as one burger for seven tenths of a hot dog. It's the same deal. So we need to decide whether this trade right here, one for seven tenths of a hot dog, is, falls within the terms of trade, within the opportunity cost. So Yvonne, two-thirds of a hot dog, Catherine, four-fifths of a hot dog, seven-tenths is less than four-fifths, yet greater than two-thirds. So both Yvonne and Catherine would benefit from these terms of trade right here. All right, so take a few minutes, stop the video, give the second part of the terms of trade sheet a try, and apply the method that we just went over to see how it goes. All right, now hopefully you took a little time to go over that second part of the terms of trade sheet, and now we're going to see how that actually went for you. So the second one dealt with Sham and Samir, and both of them are repairing TVs and, or sorry, computers and phones. Now, we take the information from the production possibility frontier and we throw it down into that table below. We have the items that they're repairing on the left. We have the people doing the, the repairing on the top. Uh, we got all the numbers there. The next thing we need to do is the opportunity costs. So we pull the opportunity cost for Sean, we pull the opportunity cost for Samir. Once again, we have production data here, so it's what you sacrifice divided by what you produce, and we have our numbers. Let's figure out who has the comparative advantage in both. Now remember, comparative advantage is a lower opportunity cost. So Sean's gonna have the lower opportunity cost or comparative advantage in phones, and Samir is gonna have the lower opportunity cost or comparative advantage in the repairing of computers. So we have that, we have almost all the information we need, the only thing left is that terms of trade. So Sham has an opportunity cost of one third a computer, Samir one computer for the repair of a phone. So one uh, a value that falls between the opportunity cost is half a computer. It can be anything greater than one third, anything less than one computer, and it would still meet the terms of trade. Now with computers, one computer for three phones, one computer for one phone, what falls in between? Two phones. So these are acceptable terms of trade right here. One phone for one half a computer, one computer for two phones. Either of these work, doesn't mean they have to be exactly that, just fall between those terms of trade. So let's answer some of these questions now that we have the data we need. Who has the comparative advantage in repairing phones? We know this is Sham. He has the lower opportunity cost, we established that before. So Sham has the comparative advantage, why? And this is one of the key things that you need to answer on an FRQ question usually, why does he have the comparative advantage? So Sham has the lower opportunity cost of repairing a phone at one-third computers compared to Samir's one computer. Include the values in that answer as well. Say that he has a lower opportunity cost and why? Include the values so you know you got the right answer. All right, second one. Who has the comparative advantage in repairing computers? Now in this case, we know it's Samir. Samir has the comparative advantage because he has a lower opportunity cost. Now, second part says, should Sham import or export computer repairs? Now we know that Samir has the comparative advantage in uh, repairing computers, so he should be the one exporting them, so Sham should be the one importing computer repairs and exporting phone repairs. So make sure you guys get that all down. Those are questions that will come up. 
The next one, give an example of acceptable terms of trade. This is a great question that they always throw out there. So we know we have this set up already. We know that one phone can be exchanged for one half a computer, or we could do one computer repair for two phones. That would be acceptable as well. So when you set it up this way, you can go either way. One phone for half a computer, one computer for two phones. Both of these are acceptable terms of trade. Now, identify a specific number of phone repairs that could be traded for 10 computer repairs and be mutually beneficial. So we know it has to fall between the terms of trade. So one computer repair for two phone repairs is acceptable. So let's just multiply that by 10. 10 computer repairs for 20 phone repairs would also be mutually beneficial. All right, so that sums it up for this one. Hopefully you were able to follow along and apply that technique that I showed you to get the right answers when it comes to terms of trade. Now, in addition to the practice sheet that was included in the description below, there is also this terms of trade kind of cheat sheet or test resource, however you want to put it, that kind of gives you a few different uh, warnings, things to look for on these types of questions, including two blank tables that you can fill out to make sure that you have all the information before trying to answer those questions. It's, it's, a, it's a guaranteed way to make these questions right and without any error. All right. So hopefully you can apply that. Take some time to give this a shot on various different FRQs. Um, I'll add a video for a 2016 FRQ where I'm going to apply this method. See what you can do with that question.